Hey, this is Elizabeth Cook. You're listening to It's Walking the Floor Over You. Yeah. I'm walking the floor over you. I'm walking the floor over you. Walking the floor. I'm walking the floor. Walking the floor over you. Hola, senors and senoritas. Hey, 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 this is Chris Shiflett coming to you with another episode of Walking the Floor, your favorite podcast, my favorite podcast, everybody's favorite podcast. Mmm, I gotta take a breath. This has been one of the best days off on tour I've had this cycle. Maybe the best day off on tour so far. I'm in Cincinnati right now. I'm just gonna go out on a limb here. I'm just gonna say Cincinnati is my new favorite American city. Somebody told me that Foo Fighters haven't played here since 1997. And if that's true, that means I've never played here with the Foo Fighters, which I think means I would have never played here or ever been to Cincinnati, but I feel like I have. So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying for sure that that is absolutely true, but it might be true. But at any rate, it's my new favorite city. Let me just run down my day for you. Uh, got in late last night, slept in, no alarm, always a treat. Um, woke up. Went out to the Game On Sports Complex out in College Hill for a little pickup uh, soccer game that we put together out there with uh, with a bunch of the guys on our crew and then uh, a bunch of local Cincinnati folks and we had an incredible time. Game On Sports Complex, fantastic. Came back into town, took a shower, walked through downtown Cincinnati to. Um, a restaurant that I can't remember the name of, but I had a delicious bowl of steaming ramen. Then went to Grater's Ice Cream, I think it was called, right across the street. Fantastic. Incredible. Grater's Ice Cream. Loved it. Uh, and now I'm back in my hotel room, just uh, getting ready to get into some Netflix because it's a night off. And I'm full and I'm tired because I worked hard today. Thank you, Cincinnati. I'm going to be so ready for the gig tomorrow night. You have no idea. I'm 100% recharged. All right. Let's get on over to Zounds.com. Okay. You know Zounds.com. It's your place on the internet for fantastic deals on music gear because instead of paying uh, full price all at once, you can pay monthly. So it, uh, Zounds.com lets you own the gear you've been dreaming of right now. There's really no reason to wait anymore. Zounds.com. Check it out. It's interview time. And don't be doubting. Don't be a cynic. Okay, when Elizabeth Cook recently stopped by Walking the Floor World Headquarters, she brought me a very nice handmade Elizabeth Cook t-shirt, which I thought was sweet because she is a very busy woman. She not only has her career as a country music singer-songwriter, you know, making records, hitting the road, etc., etc., but she also hosts a popular radio show on Sirius XM Outlaw Country called Elizabeth Cook's Apron Strings, which you should listen to if you haven't already, and you should also listen to her latest album, Exodus of Venus, which came out last year, as well as all her other records while you're at it. Why not? Uh, and if all that wasn't enough uh, already for you to go check her out, you should know she's also friends with David Letterman. She is David Letterman approved. I mean, come on. How cool is that? Friends with David Letterman. There was one little snafu in this interview that I just want to point out real quick. Um, when she mentions Aaron Lee Tajan, the Nashville-based Americana artist, who I've actually interviewed on this show, and I love, he's awesome. Uh, my brain somehow heard that as Aaron Radieri, who is a Nashville-based songwriter that I'm friends with and have written with, and I totally confused the two for some reason. I don't know why. So if Aaron Lee Tajan is out there listening, uh, I just want you to know, buddy, I know that we haven't written any songs together. I'm just getting a little bit deafer and more senile with each passing interview. All right, let's get to it. This is Elizabeth Cook on Walking the Floor. that doormat you need the doormat oh i do need the doormat well they used to sell them at ernest tub record shop oh. and then i really wanted one really bad and one day i decided i was going to get one when i was near there and i went in and they didn't have them anymore oh. they still have one in the back that was in use 
It right. actually had a piece of gum stuck on it. Did you s- steal that one? They just gave it to me. Oh, nice. So I have I have the walk in the floor over you de- uh, doormat with, oh. the, with the gum stuck on it. I don't nice. Care. I like it. I had the funny experience when I was in Nashville last time. I went to go see Robbie Turner plays in like an outlaw country Saturday night jam cover band thing. Okay. Um, right across the street from where the Grand Ole Opry is. And there's that like mall, like, you know, kind of like shopping mall area. Oh, and there's like a couple Nash- bars like in there. the Opry House or the Ryman? Well, there's okay. the Opry. It's, no, it's across from like the Opry. You know, the like, Opry the, House. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so the Nashville Palace and all that area. Yeah. And I think there's you. that store that maybe used to be another Ernest Tubbs. Yes. And then I guess when it switched in, it's like a knickknack shop now, but they yes. just left his old tour bus in yes. there. And yes. so I was in They're there. They're moving it downtown. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I was in there and I was like on his bus and was, I was just kind of killing time before Not they were cool. playing their set. And I was in there like, whoa, cool. Check out this old tour bus. Look at how they used to do it. You know? Yeah, right? know. And then I walked over there and Robbie introduced me to uh, a guy named Lynn something who was Ernest Tubbs' last pedal steel player. Oh, shit. I was like, fuck, I was just on your bus. That's so weird. Isn't it great? Yeah, and Jack Green that I played the Opry with for years, you know, came on to play drum, and then he ended up having a big hit with Statue of a Fool, but he came on to play drums with Ernest Tubb, oh. and, the, and one of the reasons they hired him on was he was a diesel mechanic. <laughs> so when the bus <laughs> right. broke down, he could fix it. Oh, that's a but good then idea. He, but then he, he had that big hit, and According to Jack, like Ernest told him, yeah, you know, you should step out front now and that's like and, a, that's, and have do your own thing. And he did, and he had that big hit. He, that's kind of a know. classic thing in country music. It seems yeah. like guys that are sort of the side men. Eventually, well, yeah. some of them get their break, you know. Even if you just look at Emmy Lee's top band, you know, Ricky right. Skaggs, Vince Gill, Rodney Crowell, right. all came right, up right, through, right. through yeah. Emmy Lee's band. So it was cool. So how do you get out on the West Coast much? Do you tour out here much? Uh, yeah, you're you know, in the middle of a tour right now. I am right? in the middle of a tour right now. I mean, it's it's uh, it's been a little sporadic lately. I used to when I had a more steady touring thing going. But then about 2012, I got into some TV business stuff. Then about 2014, like six people in my family died. And, mm. and there were divorces and house fires and stuff. And so all that has put me in quite a respite until last year. So uh-huh. I just started back. So there's right. been like a hiccup, you know. Well, so a, I hope to get that groove going where I am out here at least doing a tour at least once or twice a year. Right. You know, hit the hit uh, Southwest Coast and do the Northwest mm. in, in the fall. I mean, they're, they're, it always strikes me as kind of, it makes me sad because a lot of the country people that I that I interview don't really get out here much, you yeah. know. And they obviously the West Coast used to have such a thriving yeah. country music scene. Bakersfield, yeah. and, and I, I was just with Jeannie Seeley out at the Grand Ole Opry, and you know really? she was married to Hank Cochran, right? And they all came up through the L- Harlan Howard, and yep. her best girlfriend Jan Howard was married to Harlan. They were all that L.A. '60s right. country that all like migrated to Nashville and had such a huge impact on country mm. music as we know it. So. All those um, folks moved out there after kind of making it out here. Yeah. That's really just, interesting. Just being with Seeley the other night, and we were celebrating 50 years on the Grand Ole Opry for her, and she was talking about one of the many scandals around her and, and for, you know, sort of forging the way for women on the Grand Ole Opry was that uh, she got in trouble for wearing a miniskirt, um, called to the <laughs> office, and didn't know why she was being called to the office. Like, they were talking to her about it, and she still didn't know what the hell they right, were talking right. about. Right, right. And she finally figured it out. But she said, you know, I came from the West Coast, so right. I was just wearing... She said, I never had my own style. I just wore what everybody else was always wearing. And right. crop tops and and uh, mini skirts and, How you know, that, and go-go boots. And she's like, yeah, that was... That was a shocker for the for the Opry. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you you got to keep in mind, like, the Grand Ole Opry used to not, like, have drums. I mean, like, even yeah, right, that was, like, right. a big deal I at know. one point. Like, <laughs> wasn't that, like, Bob Wills or something, the first guy that brought drums on there? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. How did you... Are you a member of the Grand Ole Opry? I'm not a member. I but hold, you've done, like, what, hundreds of appearances hundreds, on yeah. there? Yeah, I, I, I believe that I hold the record for the most appearances of a non-member of the Grand Ole Opry, which <laughs> is not, like, the record you really uh-huh. want, but it's... It's the one I've got. That's a good record. Um, yeah, I'll take it. Uh, over 400 appearances. We quit counting after Daddy died. He used to. He he was up in the 300s of counting. Mm. And uh, so yeah, I started on the Grand Ole Opry in 2000. I think was my day. I mean, how does that work? Foggy. Do they just call you like, hey, we need you in here this Saturday? They had an. They had yes, um, yes. And and especially then when I had those early years, I had a major label record deal, and they weren't real big on like helping me develop touring. They want you to have mm. the hit and then tour. Right. I wanted to tour so I would get better. Yeah. Um. But they just, you know, I just was stuck at home all the time. So the Opry caught wind of that and knew that 
I was somebody they could call on Thursday or Friday, and having an older cast, people would cancel all the time. Right. And that I was somebody that they could call that would come out and sing an old country song with the staff band and, you know, help take up time and make up part of the show. That they were also trying to develop, too. They're always trying to invest and develop in artists coming up, so then as artists do well, there's still an allegiance there and a connection to the Opry that helps keep the Opry viable. So, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it works that way for them, I guess. That's my right. guess. I don't really know, but... Well, let's let's talk a little bit about your latest record. I know there was like kind of a, a gap of a few years. It looks like if you look at your discography, you're making records every two, three years for a right, while there, right. making a bunch of records, and then there was like a six-year gap. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know you had a gospel record in there somewhere, but but between like original records. So yeah. uh, I'm wondering why, like what what took so long around yeah. that time? Well, um, so Welder is the record that came out in 2010. Mm. And then about 2012, I had gone to the beach and I was um, finishing up material for the new record. And out of the blue, like I got a call from David Letterman to come be on his TV show. Right. On the couch, like not play, but like be interviewed. And I was like, what the hell is happening? Like, I didn't understand. This was real, real out of the blue. Wait, so he um, called you to not to perform? Because right. I, okay, I was wondering about that because I was yes. watching some of those old appearances, and yes. the one that was the first one, I couldn't find the performance. I was like, why isn't the performance right? Up there? Because he came to know me through my radio show on Sirius XM. Mm. So he had just he wanted to have me on as this radio personality. He he had you know okay. gotten interested in. Is Letterman a country music fan? Yes, massive. Really massive, uh. um, especially um, from the from the tentacle that is like folk singer songwriter. So right. big town. Man Zant. We right. were just having a conversation the other day through text about John Hartford. Mm. Like, really, yes, very, very much. Um, just a deep music fan in general. Right. Um, everything from Grateful Dead to, to Guy Clark. Nancy Griffith, he always loved mm. really Nancy a lot. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, that's cool. So, he had me on, and and I, I was, um, that. so that kind of blew up everything. And we're like, oh, my God, okay, so we're going on the Letterman show. What's happened? I was super freaked out. Um, never met him until I walked on the set on in front of the cameras. First time I laid eyes on him. Mm-hmm. Um, got through that interview, and then it was like my manager described it as a really good bomb went off. And the next thing I knew, I had a sitcom deal with CBS. Really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. So um, that caused me to start spending a lot of time in L.A. Right. Because um, there's a ceiling on being an Americana star, you know. And <laughs> right. I was like, you know, hey, we, you know, my people, I still got people in trailers, so um, we, you know, I need to, I need to do this. It's yeah. this opportunity in front of me. So that, that was a big distraction. Um, right. So that sort of reset my course there for a couple of years. So it's like that's what, 2012. What that? Did that ever air? No. Um, they ordered the pilot. They never shot it. Um, they ordered it to be written. They never right. shot it. Um, what was the, what was the show going to be like? It was, was like they got a, a writer named Tim Doyle from Roseanne. And it was me as a single mom in an apartment in Washington, D.C., I think. And then my daddy, my old, like, you know, old cracker daddy shows up (laughs) out of jail, fresh, and causing mayhem. And I have problems at work and all that kind of thing. Wacky hijinks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and my hillbilly family shows up. But um, the way they describe that format is so broad that it was hard to make specific cultural jokes that would possibly anything that would be endearing about my scenario. Right. Um, so they fight that little battle. And I think that kind of hurt. I don't really know. Anyway, from there to like reality shows, do you want to host something? CMT, mm. A&E, like it just kept going. Yeah. Um, till about 2014. And then my daddy died suddenly. Mm. And then my mother-in-law died. My brother-in-law died. My brother died. Um, Jesus. Uh, the farm burned down. I got a divorce. My sister got a divorce. And all that happened in about a two-year period. Right. Um, so I went to, yeah, I, there were some folks not appreciating my coping skills. I went to rehab um, and yeah, I, now struggled I read something there for about a while. That. I read something that you talked about that where you talked about you went to rehab. Yeah. But that you but that was because of pressure from like your label and management or something. Not, yes. And you and, and you said I like I was never a, a drug addict. Mm-mm. And it just, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sober so I can say this, but it made me giggle a little bit because <laughs> nobody can deny being a drug addict without sounding like a drug addict. The you minute can. you say, the minute you go, yeah. hey, I'm not a I'm drug not, addict. It's like, <laughs> like if you yeah, sound yeah. like Nixon yeah. going, I'm not a crook, <laughs> right, you, know? you know? what I mean? But the truth is when I went in and I joke about this and I even posted on Instagram one time, I think like um, I failed all my drug tests. Like I tested negative for everything, right. but I was also super underweight mm. and I had a bad day I, at an award show at the AMA awards. I took a 
a toxic mix of drugs throughout the day to right. get through the day. I right. was under a lot of public scrutiny. There were a lot of rumors going around in mm. that little high school type world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very embarrassed. I was a scandal. Um, and I just was coping through the day and word got out of what I had done and mm. it was stupid and was I had this a like bad something day. That happened but so on camera or is this like it was just rumor mill right. and it all got But there's no like YouTube around. clip of you stumbling off the stage no, or anything. Not that, that I know of. Right, uh, there's okay. a picture of no depression of me and Todd Snyder kinda locked up. Right. That looks bad. Right. Um because <laughs> we were both super skinny and I was about to go on a month long like twenty eight day tour yeah. with him, ironically, and they were right. like, No, you need to go to rehab for twenty eight mm. days. I was super underweight too, so they were they suspected that I might have an eating disorder. Okay. Um, so they sent me to a broad place that could help either of those things that mm -hmm. SAG after one pay for um, in San Diego that treated both uh, eating disorders and drug addiction. Mm. And I, I was starving to death. They weren't giving me enough calories. Everything was super regulated. That's ironic. And uh, it was ironic. <laughs> and um, I would go and I would like, I got in trouble for like wearing my sunglasses inside, and been, but I had a migraine from them messing with my meds, you know, and oh, it was such a shit show. Um, and they said, well, we'll give you protein shakes in between meals. And I'm like, okay, there's no caffeine. They give you two packs of sugar. Like no it, everything caffeine. is super regular. I'm checking out super, of that rehab. They with sit no and caffeine. watch you Jesus. eat. They, they sit and watch you eat. Um, so it's super, super scrutinized. Mm. Um, so I was, How long I, you I was offended. I, st I lasted 11 days, but. Um, the, there was this flight attendant in there that was in there for being a wild woman, and she actually stole the weight log from the nutritionist office. And I could see they come in and weigh me in the dark in the morning and not tell me what I weighed. Because um, I first I asked like, "How am I looking?" You know, and and they were like, "Well, it's you know not we can't say." And then the director came and said, "You're not going in the right direction." And it was like I'm asking for these protein shakes in between meals, and I go to the nurses' station and they don't have them, and hmm. the kitchen's gone home. Right, right. So I'm starving, and they're like, "Well, you're on three thousand calories a day." I was like, "Well, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm hungry." And you're telling me I'm losing weight, and this is none of this is working. Right. So I called my girlfriend, and I was like, you can come get me, or I'm going to check out front here and get my credit cards and find my way to a bus station. I'll figure it out that I'm leaving because I'm starving. Mm. Can you please just take me to Whole Foods? I'll meet you at In-N-Out Burger. <laughs> please. In -N -Out I know. That's what I had when they on the way in. I had In-N-Out. I tried so hard to beg my way out of going. But mm. the people that had you know a lot of power and influence in my world at that time were like, well, Who's that management and label management folks? and close friends? Right. Um, and there was a divide in the camp and, and some risk that continue to this day between friends and family that mm. were on both sides. Like some right. people are like, no, she doesn't but need to go. Since and that people time, are like, no, you need to go. Since that time, you didn't, don't, haven't you gotten like new management, new band, new label? Yes. Divorce, yes. Above, all, yes. all this stuff. So it's, yes. it's, it's everything. And your record came out in what, the middle of last year? Mm -hmm. So is everything, are you settled into whatever yeah. changes you made in your sort of career? And yeah. And oddly, like the two people that were most influential in, in putting me into rehab, I'm, I'm close with again, mm. you know? But, um, but I'm also in a lot, I was in a vulnerable place, no right. doubt. And I needed help, no yeah. doubt. And I was very sick and I made stupid decisions. And, right, right. But when they had the intervention, they were like, do you feel like you're making good decisions for yourself? And I was like, well, well no. I, I mean, I don't feel like I make good decisions on the cereal aisle, you know? So right. no, I don't make good decisions ever, you know? So they... Uh, well, that is but, one of the funny things. I mean, I'm, and I hate to throw myself into your story, but, no. um, you know, I figured out after being sober for a while, and I've been sober for almost 11 years now, but That's I figured funny. out, like, uh, everything that I blamed on being an alcoholic was actually just there anyway. So like bad decisions <laughs> and things like that, that's all just in you. You're just that's, adding to the problem. Yeah, like yeah. just getting rid of the booze or whatever is like, that's part of it, yeah. but that's not the main part of it. Yes. You know what I mean? Like You're just coping in using that stuff You're right, yeah. with whatever's already going on. Ag yeah. Agreed, agreed. And so yeah, a new, new crew around me now made that record um, and just well, sort of resetting. Through all that time uh, of whatever was going on with family deaths and rehab, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Were you writing and working and getting a, getting a new album together while all that was kind of happening around not, you? Not really. Um, I was uh, heavily medicated then on psych meds after that coming out. And mm. uh, that really, boy, I, I did good to stick a toothbrush in my mouth. You know, I was just really not in good shape. But um, was dating this guy that wanted to make a record on me, knew I needed to make a record. And so he would get out his guitar and play like some riff and I would just basically scat lyrics over it right. and they'd record it. And those are the songs on Exodus of Venus. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I had a few. Um, Tabitha Tudor's Mom and Methadone Blues were two songs that I had written going right before I went into the rehab thing. Right. Um, so I was, and I even went and demoed those to try and show them. No, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Yeah. I sit on the bus with Todd with my journals. Like I'll, I'll write the, I'll keep writing. Now that's what I want to do. But all that was then disrupted by the the rehab was another trauma, and then mm. the psych meds that came after it, um, another trauma. So. It's taken a while to dig out of that. So I kind of eked out Exodus of Venus in some sort of like right. dark ether. I mean, you can um, hear that on the record. I mean, stylistically, it's a little different than than stuff you've done in the past. Yeah. It's a little more like, um, you know, sort of space echo, delay pedal, yeah. reverby yeah. Ki kind of thing. Sonically, to it. And it does have sure. like a darkness to it. Yeah. You know, it's a, there's a moodiness to it. Mm -hmm. um, was that, uh, did that just sort of happen? Or was that out of, um, you know, was that intentional? Well, I think that the material just dictated that. Right. Like, I always feel like when you write a song, at least initially, and sometimes, especially good songs, can be packaged a number of ways. Right. But um, that's just like the sonic sort of wrapping paper that right. those, that, that was the mood, the sound of the mood. Yeah. So um, that's, that's why, I think. Is that how you normally have written in the past? Like those, that kind of collaboration? No, I'd never really collaborated like that before um, because Welder is almost, you know, very few co-writes on there. I write by myself a lot. But then the um, Exodus ended up being with the producer a right. lot, who was my boyfriend at the time. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, he had the guitar and the pedals and yeah. kind of led me, to, you know, tethered me to a little he had the microphone. He had the yeah. reverb pedal. <laughs> you he, had gotta, the pedal you that guy. he had the pedal board. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, that's. So that that's why those ended up being like that, and he would really literally just like start playing one of the riffs that's the intro to the song, and I would just start singing something over it and, and writing like, down. How did your fans? How have your fans uh, reacted to it? Uh, you know, uh, really well, and I was concerned um, because people get I feel like sometimes get married to a certain ideal of you. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely, but. If it, if if they're married to you just because of a certain sound you make, or if they or if they're married to you as an artist because of the journey that you take them on, and that they relate to you regardless of what you're just going through, like if they just relate to your human experience and how you express that musically, and that's what I found. Like mm. a lot of people went with me, and a lot of people really enjoyed having the sort of rough folk edges shaved off. I right, think I think right. they liked the sort of ethereal kind of lush sonic landscape that you can kind of just relax into a little bit more. So it wasn't as intense in some ways. It was softer in some ways and I darker. Th I think it's interesting that your last record in some ways sounds more akin to like, you know, mainstream country mm -hmm. and not like the broke country type of stuff, but you know, certain elements of mainstream country. Um, like I'm thinking like maybe like the Osborne brothers or something would, would come right. to mind. Um, Whereas the major label album you made sounds way more old school country mm -hmm. than what you think of as sort of modern mainstream country. Yeah, which the major label, like what, the 2002 record? Yeah, which it was yeah. the one... Uh, hey Y'all. Yes. Yeah, oh, that was a shit show. Um, How'd you sneak that by them? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Well, that... <laughs> I was signed to Atlantic Records by a guy that was president of Atlantic Nashville for 30 minutes that wanted to uh, try to inject some sort of traditional country wave back into it. Oh, okay. So I got signed under that. Atlantic folded in the Time Warner AOL merger. Warner Brothers got my contract. Um, they were instructed to leave me alone until the record was finished, hmm. um, which they, I think, took great pleasure in being able to do that. That was one less responsibility. Um, so, and they just let me finish my record and kind of mm. let that peter out mm. and then wanted me to make another one more right. in the vein of Faith Hill, who they were having great success with at the time, um, because I was blonde and under 150 pounds. So they were like, well, this is what we do with you. Um, but I was writing weird country songs and yeah. had this hillbilly voice. And so, did, I you mean, know, that you was never going to jive. Stuff that sounds like that. Did they sort of put you in into studios no, with those kind of producers and that sort of thing that never came out no okay. it just yeah it was just like a bad fit like they the, it i couldn't sing like that i mm. couldn't write like that i'm right. just not good at it and i felt guilt over that actually because at one point daddy was like look Shug, they're playing you 
a lot. You're making money right now. You got these publishing deals based on this major label deal. You got all this, and you're supposed to do a job you get paid to do. Right. Point blank. You know, I know you're artists and all that. He's like, but you get you do the job you're getting paid to do. That's how we are. Right. And I kind of tried. Like, I go down and do the co-writes with, you know, Clint and Trent and who the hell ever and <laughs> at, go to scoreboards for lunch and do all the shit you do. And I just was miserable. Like, really? I, su- I just wasn't good at it. I was, like, trying to do a job that What's like the worst? Being on the track team and being a slow runner, you know, I was just what, like, what's, oh, what God. was like the worst experience for you in in doing a co-write? Did you ever have one where people where it just you could tell within five minutes it just was going nowhere, and you got to sit there for them. the whole three hours? All of them, <laughs> and 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 like yeah, they'd say some line, and then I'd throw out a line that I thought was like cool and weird, and they right. kind of look at me weird, and I'd be like, oh shit, you know, and it's we just and then we'd trying... come out with something that everybody hated, right, right, you know, and then there were co writers there was a small handful of of old school music row writers down on music row that were really great like Mm. guys that had written some alan jackson hits right right you know don schlitz and jim mcbride and and i like writing with those old guys because they were real they knew where you were coming from they were trad country they didn't mind you know my voice like they could write for that it was nothing like what the radio was playing though and the publishing companies and the labels weren't interested in that i mean Mm. you're it was the height of faith hill and shania twain and sure you know they didn't there was no Tammy, room for Tammy Wynette throwback. It's funny when you're writing with other people and you throw out an idea for a song and everyone in the room just kind of goes, hmm. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Got anything else? <laughs> it's really hard. And right. then it's just so demoralizing because it's so, it's a very vulnerable thing oh, to yeah. do. And yeah. I have a hard time. I think with writing it. might be the most vulnerable thing. Yeah, I like doing it by myself yeah. um, mostly. I do have a little group of people now that are sort of in my circle that I have just natural sensibilities with. Right. And I enjoy being with them. You yeah. know, Aaron Lee Tashjian, oh, a guy named Darren Brad. Aaron. Aaron Lee yeah. is a close, close buddy. We've got um, well, one working songs on for with his. Him, actually. Uh, yeah. he's, he's great. great. I'll write with Aaron Lee. You know what yeah. I mean? Or or because you're not gonna get he too makes weird. It you're not fun. gonna get he too makes weird it with fun. Aaron Lee. Yeah. And oh he comes over to my house like he's yeah, we're 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 tight. He's on boo. And then Wade Sapp is a young kid coming up from Lake Okeechobee, Florida. He is super talented. Mm. Um, Darren Bradbury, a young folk guy coming up um, yeah. from New Jersey. He's really great. And so there's it's an interesting moment right now um, it, around East Nashville and, and South Madison where I live. It's sort of like a little crew packing up. Mm. And, um, and these guys, so I'm readdressing co-writing right. considering my new environment. Sure. But I can't do, go down with Clinton Trent at scoreboards and write like <laughs> another song about you know a truck and the cup you drink out of and all that stuff who like who are your people who's your fan base is it americana people mainstream country people a little mix of both man i wish i knew it'd probably be a lot easier um it is it's because you seem it like feels you, tread, very you, cobbled. you walk that line i feel like You're, it feels very cobbled it feels like there are more and more and this is the actually my you know what i my favorite probably is like people that are coming to know me as a as a serious singer-songwriter, as a narrative folk, country folk singer-songwriter. So I really like that. Um, so folks coming to know me from that. There's the outlaw country base, people mm. that just listen to me on the radio every day right. and want to come, you know, hang out and hear Who me play anything. Who is the outlaw that, country base? Like, I always wonder that, like, because I listen to outlaw country. Yeah. Um, and But I sort of came to country through the side door. Like, are, are you getting people like me, like rock and roll people yes. that like it? And, but are you also getting, like, you know, the 60-year-old dude that... Wishes country still sounded like that yes. kind of thing. You yes. know what I mean? There's like your your sort of militant country, you know, new country sucks or only like Waylon and David Onco. There's that sect. There's people that are just nostalgic for it because they grew up on it. Right. It's, you know, we, I feel like we live in such a transient culture now. I have people come up and say, come up to me at a show in, in, in New York City and be like, you know, hey, I'm a I'm a surgeon at John Hopkins and we listen to your record while I do surgery. And I'm like, what? <laughs> right. Like, what, are You're you like, sure? Huh? Yeah. yeah, you know, so Is there's that. Is that really healthy? And Rain Wilson, John Hamm, those got like, John Hamm was at my mm. last show here. I couldn't believe it. I was so embarrassed. I was like smoking weed out back and he walked by with a baseball cap down low and trying uh. to say hi. And I was like, trying to like, was like, hey, cool. See, thanks for coming, you know? And he was like, oh, and I was like, oh, shit, you know? So I'm always surprised. Um, and then there'll be like a table of girlfriends that are there because mm. they want to hear balls to be a woman. You right, know, they like right. a strong female. So there's the radio base. There's the old trucker dudes. There's heady people that are just love country music. There's 
you know, all manner of successful entertainers that it's wild. Right. I, I can't put my finger on it. I, I mean, wish I could. It's such a different world now being like, you know, a, a musician and with the way that the industry has changed. And obviously mm-hmm. you have to do a lot of other other stuff. I mean, you're talking about TV deals and things that you, you were trying out and you got your radio show and then there's making records and touring and all that sort of stuff. I mean, does the business side of being an artist cut into your creative space? Absolutely. Um, but it's also a side that I don't mind because I always liked math a lot um, coming up in school. So and I even went through like four calculuses in college, like as an elective, because I had this weird thing with obsession have like an with math. Degree or yeah. Something like that? And yeah. so I, I double major in accounting computer information systems, and I was an auditor for Pricewaterhouse for 18 months when I first moved to Nashville. Really? And so I've always had, I think, I don't know. The head doc says, well, you came up in a chaotic home. You liked structure. So anywhere there was like finite structure and certainty, you liked right. that. And that's math. their theory of why I have an affinity for math and structure. So mm. I get into it. I used to do actually do little spreadsheets for my tours and stuff where right. I would know what roughly what I was going to come home with before I walked out the door. I knew how to cost out fuel approx you know approximate merch sales based on venue size um i did, did all that and it's just it's a little hot like some people do crosswords and just stick around with it right. so i don't I, I don't mind it um but yeah for sure and nowadays like you know being active on social media and it, it just keeps taking different forms but yeah i don't just get to like hang out in a kimono and drink coffee and be artsy all day you <laughs> right, know right. i don't that's, wait till the muse hits for, yeah, yeah you know no that's not and and i do have to fight for that time i have right. to fight for that time which ought, is so ironic because that's what everything is based on sure that's what everything yeah. everything Without thrives that, there's on. nothing else right. everything yeah. needs that yeah. and that's the thing i have to fight the hardest to, to yeah get. it's it's funny i mean i was thinking about it um, when I was getting, you know, just doing a little research on you and stuff, and I was thinking about my own experience. And, you know, I made a record last year and spent about a month. I mean, I spent months writing it, yeah. of course, and then about a month working, you know, making it. Yeah. And then about nine months getting it ready to put it out. Yeah. And in that nine months, it was like all consuming. And, you know, meanwhile, I, you know, was right back into work with Foo Fighters. So I got that going on full time. And then I'm like Good getting night. the artwork and talking to the label and the, hiring the publicist and all that sort of stuff. And it really does like yeah. it's it's a full time job when you're, you know, I'm not an, a, an indie artist in my main gig, but in my you know, my sort of Americana stuff, yeah, I very much am. And it, that is like a full time gig just on its yes. own, you know. Yes. Um, well, as you know, as everything restructures and there starts to be a little bit of business to be had around that, yeah. there's young people coming up that want to have this job in this world um, mm. that are very savvy. And I've been fortunate to, you know, my millennials, I call them, that are around that, that are helping me do everything from make the t-shirts in the garage yeah. to um, to helping me work social media and, and um look at touring and and i try and keep keep them close because right. they're they're having a great time and a great experience and they're they're helping me a lot in this new age of mm. like just all the little tasks that have to be done like overseeing the artwork right. and all those things it's yeah. crazy you gotta rely on those millennials for that social I media have my mom, good lord i gotta ha- i gotta have them yeah they're yeah. they're funny like yeah my my girl carter lee that lives with me i'm just like i can't copy and paste this you know text and this instagram post i'm gonna throw my phone in the yard so she'll come get it or go get it out of the yard and yeah. face it. <laughs> yeah i got i got a guy named alec that helps me out with all that stuff he's my millennial yeah yeah i love them i love yeah. them they're they're fun and they can't cook and i can so i feed them they're they're at my house eating all the time i yeah, have this, this door swap. coming in and out yeah. and I, I feed them and and they they help me and I appreciate it. Well, let's back up a little bit. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Wildwood, Florida, which is central between uh, Gainesville and Orlando mm. inland. So if you think about it's it's Tom Petty land. Right. You know, Leonard Skinner, Allman Brothers. Graham Parsons. Graham Parsons right, yeah, land. Right. Winter Haven, absolutely. Um, 
uh, John Anderson, Bobby Braddock, mm. uh, that that scene. Uh, so inland country people in Florida, which is kind of an overlooked contingency of right. the, of Florida, but right. but we exist. We are we are a people and a, a culture. I, I, I am ashamed to admit I didn't even ever think of anywhere in Florida being inland. I know. <laughs> I, just think of the whole I thing know. Just it's coastal. all like a coast. Right. Yeah, it's just a, a line. Of, a it's either coastal perimeter. or a highway going from one side to the other. <clears throat> right. Right. It's, it's actually a pretty big landmass of right. the state. And so it was just a little cow town. Mm. And um, my my daddy had uh, got shipped there to, to build a jail. He was in jail in um, Atlanta Federal. And they uh, shipped him to Sumter County Correctional. And he helped build that jail. Mm. And uh, when he got out, he met my mother, who had fled West Virginia mountains with her five uh-huh. children. And was living with family down there that worked the rail citrus coming up from the railroad. So, and I know had, your dad was a musician. But was your mm-hmm. mom a musician too? Yes, my mother, my daddy was like more like an entertainer. You know, right. he played upright bass in the prison band. He yeah, was, yeah, yeah. you know, was led. It was band leader for the for the prison band, and but he liked to entertain and party was his deal more than he was an actual concert right. musician. He plunked on the bass mm. and fancied himself a blues man. But, well, you know the bass in the bass player in in those old country bands. It was like a tradition that they they were the comedian. They were like the comedian, That's right? Exactly yeah, right. I can. I'll, matter of fact, I'll text you a picture of his prison band, and they're all like in outfits, nice. you know, kind of prison issued outfits, but they're in outfits <laughs> right. with little scarves and stuff. Yeah. But Daddy is in pants that has suspenders that were way too big with rocks in the pockets, so when he walked, they bounced up and down nice. in a big straw hat. Nice. And his upright bass. Showmanship. Um, yes. That's um, an yeah. important that, lesson. That was his jam. Like yeah. he was that. Mother was actually a con- she was a really really good musician. Oh, really? She was an idiot savant on mandolin. Mm. Um, started learning off Bill Monroe Records in Charleston, West Virginia, when she was sixteen. So mm. she got her first guitar when she was twelve. She was a hillbilly singer that worked the old farm hours around uh, Charleston, West Virginia, in the mornings with her girlfriend Gloria May. They were the melody duo, and they played for the coal miners that were getting on the trains to go in to work the mines. Really? Yes. Yeah, so she what, was, for, and they were really, they were thing? really good. No, they were on, you know, all those old farm hours in on the radio that would broadcast. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So she was work, work with a guy named Buddy Starcher mainly, but um, so it was like they would get up. You know, in the middle of the night, right? And in the snow and everywhere, everywhere, where else? Get all the way down to these little uh, radio stations, and they'd have live music shows in sure. the morning. And she played those, real, real good. Um, they got invited to be with uh, on uh, Will and West Virginia's kind of version of the Grand Ole Opry, WWBA. Mm. And uh, her girlfriend got got married, and then she got married and started having babies. But she kept playing for years, and yeah. and um. Played mandolin and sang around, and they even opened for me at, as I started making records in adulthood as the Medicare duo. Mom oh and Daddy my God, did. how cool is that? It was great. Yeah, they were great. I'd, my band would back them, and um, they just did old country songs. Mother right. was also a really good songwriter, hmm. and she would write. She was like Loretta Lynn. She right. would. She one of the last songs she wrote was called "The Little Blue Pill," and it was about Daddy getting Viagra. Really? Yeah. So she was still writing like <laughs> That's her amazing. her country music. Right. Woman. Have you ever covered any of her songs? I did. There's one on Welder called I'm Beginning to Forget. I think, does Dwight sing that one or uh, somebody singing on it with me? Might be Rodney Crowell. I can't remember. I haven't listened to that in a minute. But somebody sang with me and we did. And that was her 45 record that she Mm. made, I think, in the 60s. Wow. Um, So, yeah, Mother was actually a serious musician. Right. Yeah. And you started performing when you were like four years old or something, right? Yeah. What made you get up? How did you have the confidence to get up on stage at that time at that age i didn't i was just a little kid doing what my parents said you know and they had both had five kids before that were way older than me so i was a one-off late in life mother was 42 when she had me Uh, okay daddy was 48 so they had their own little honky-tonk band they were making up at that point down in florida and they didn't let me coming along change their scene so they would be having band rehearsal in the back bedroom of the house and i just this lonely kid um, so they'd pull me in, and Mother would write out on poster board. Um, I, she taught me Hey, Hey, Good Looking mm. and uh, old Hank Williams songs and stuff like that. So was that I would your get first up thing? with their band and then sing a song. But I was just standing there like a little robot, like a kid you put on the soccer field at that age. You yeah, know, you're yeah, just yeah. kind of like looking around. I'm just doing what these people are telling me because they give me food. Like, I don't know. <laughs> right. So it was like that. I wasn't like, hand me the mic. I want to entertain. I right, was never right, right. that kid and okay. still am not. <laughs> It's kind oh, of my least favorite part of it. But. That's really interesting. When did it become, um, you know, when did you sort of have that 
thing like, ooh, I want to do this for a, a life. You know, I want to do this professionally. Like, did you have high school bands and go through that whole thing? No, not really. I, you know, when uh, Daddy quit drinking when I was eight because Mother had written a song called Does My Daddy Love the Bottle More and He Loves Me? And um, Daddy quit drinking and that kept us out of the bars. They sort of made a project out of me then fronting my own band until I was 12 and I wanted mm. to be a cheerleader. I decided um, that was going to be my career path because <laughs> at that point, Central Florida wasn't in a lot of ways out. And um, if you're a cheerleader, you might can marry a watermelon farmer. So, uh, but I started going to the, the little church that they had sent me to when I was a baby, which was the Sunset Park Church of God. And it was a big, holy rolling Southern gospel, rocking Southern gospel country band mm. every you know Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And they rocked for hours in that church. Speaking in tongues, slain in the spirit. All really? The, oh, yeah. And, yeah, my parents used to just send me there as a babysitter. So I grew up there. Right. Knew all the people in my neighborhood that went there. Is gospel music like one of your primary influences? I'd though? say it was my first exposure to what I would classify as rock and roll. Really? Yes. Um, the, you know, like, if you think about where Elvis jumped off. Sure. Listening to those in Memphis, you know, yeah. that's what he was hearing. He was hearing revival music. Right. It's the same. Th it's it's raucous. It's, um, you know, way over the top, electric guitars, drums. It wasn't, it was country flavored, but it was way more, it wasn't structured and proper and appropriate. It was right. wild. Right, right, right. It was right. wild. It was wild with Jesus, but it was wild. <laughs> so um, That's an album right there, Wild, yeah, wild with Jesus. Wild with Jesus. <laughs> it was wild with Jesus. So that was like, whoa, this is this is a wild scene. And sure. so when I was 12 um, and started, I started going back there again. And, and so I would sing there. But then after I got out of college, you know, it was dark being around bars and my mom and daddy and the drinking and the fighting and, and all that stuff. I didn't really want to be around that world. Right. But after I got that accounting job in Nashville after college, boy, that really sucked. And I was like, well, I don't want to do this. But meanwhile, through all that time with gospel and your and your family's, you know, country music and all that stuff, I mean, we're, I think, roughly the same age. Were you also listening to... Nirvana or, or New Kids on the Block or what you know was all yeah. was that other stuff kind of seeping yeah. in there too. I got I got a boombox when I was twelve because okay. that was the eighties, and I picked up a station out of Orlando that was playing music then. So I was starting to hear. That's where I first heard like Michael Jackson, right, and, right, and started having at, to my own accord being able to listen to music like that. Got way into it. My first non rock cons, I mean non country concert was. Madonna on the Like a Virgin tour. The Ooh, Beastie wow. Boys opened. Oh, I remember I'd that. I never heard rap before. <laughs> Freaked everybody in the whole Coliseum in Orlando out. But my I was 12 years old. You know, my parents drove me and three girlfriends to mm. see Madonna. And so that was my first exposure to yeah. that. So, yeah, there was there was that. And then definitely got way into the Beastie Boys in high school. Started um, hearing about the Rolling Stones. My sister had left a cassette tape in the house of the Almond Brothers and Creedence Clearwater Revival. Mm. So I'd had exposure to Southern rock. Yeah. Um, and loved that. And yeah. loved the Eagles and loved, and loved all those sounds, too. So, yeah, it was sort of a hodgepodge of all those different things coming in. Yeah. But I grew up just knowing, like, I knew Buck Owens before I knew... Happy birthday, I think. Right. You know. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I saw you on, I think it was maybe your first uh, Letterman interview, and you refer, you, and you do this with a lot of humor, but you refer to your family as a bunch of hillbillies, and you talk about your dad going to prison for moonshine and, and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. And it's, and, and it's funny the way you, you, know, you tell a story, but there must have been like a heaviness to that as well. Yeah, you know... <laughs> And all that has really, to be honest, just started coming home to roost. Um, really? Yeah, my head doc talks to me about it. She's like, when you tell me these stories, she's like, you've got a smile on your face like it's for entertainment. And I was like, well, my daddy was a really, really funny, funny guy. Right. And we did laugh about it a lot. We kind of thought it was funny. You know, <laughs> it was like laughter through tears. Right. Um, I mean, in some ways, it sounds like your upbringing was pretty like, you know, the... Typical American cheerleader going to church and you know all that sort of stuff, but then there's there's these you know other in some ways, <laughs> elements but it's like, as well. It was funny. It was like because we were still kind of the trash of the town. Hmm. You know, Daddy had a welding shop in the front yard and a and we had a garden in a neighborhood where those things weren't appropriate to have around your house. Right. Um, but my daddy was such a charismatic man, 
And so, like, worked like he would build the dumpsters for the cities and help the farmers with their welding needs. And, like, we were an important part of the community. And they had that band that played at that trashy bar, but everybody knew who we were and everybody loved my mom and daddy. So, even though we were. We were trashy, and it, we were white trash for sure, but we weren't ostracized for some reason, mm. which was kind of weird looking back. I mean, back. clearly the way you talk about your dad and your mom too, but your dad, you know, you talk about a lot, and it's obviously with a, a lot of love. It doesn't uh, sound like there's like great. resentment there you he know, was that you an, might have had. He was a maniac. He was insane. He was roaring drunk, you know. Mm. One of my first memories is sitting on his knee, and with him was just, I think, just in shorts and a gun across us, having a standoff with a trailer park because they were trying to take me because I'm sure he had been on a bender for a few days. And I think, you know, child service or somebody was trying to trying to get me. Mm. And he was like, nope. And so, like, I was, like, really protected. Right. At the same time in great danger. <laughs> you know, <it> was <laughs> right. just like, yeah. ironic. Yeah. There was so much love and fun. Even around all the the drinking and being poor and living in trailers, and mm. but we had great food and great music and great times, and and I don't I don't know how to explain that. You know, I, I loved loved it. I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it. Um, but yeah, I guess you know, I guess it was rough. Well, it's, it was rough. it's fueled a lot of songs, I'm sure. Yeah, I think so. It continues to right. Um, yeah. Continues to. Well, so fast forward a little bit, so. Was it after college that you made your first record, which what you put out yourself, or was an indie mm-hmm. release? Is that the Blue Record? Yeah, the Blue Record um, made with a with a publisher. I got signed to a little publisher okay. in Nashville on Music. So Ride. you had moved to Nashville. At this I point. had moved like, to did Nashville. You already know I'm gonna I'm gonna be a professional musician. This one this is my dream. No, I had moved to Nashville because that's where my Price Waterhouse job was. Okay. Yes, but there was a publishing company that I heard just through a friend that knew I could sing a little bit that said, "Hey, they need a traditional girl country singer to sing some." of their old catalog and I was like well I miss singing and I miss having music in my life so I went down there on my lunch break to to do it and I played a song I had written in my business suit you know to just sort of you know let him hear me sing a little bit and he offered me a publishing deal on the spot and I was Mm. so miserable in the corporate environment I didn't fit in I didn't wear the right clothes you know I was just like I really really struggled um in the culture of corporate I could do the work but the corporate culture I did I had I was getting in trouble all the time. Right. So when I got offered that deal, I was like, I'll tell you, it was half the money. I got rid of my apartment. I moved into the publishing company. It was the old Warner Brothers building down on Music Row. It had a shower. And I Wait, lived, you moved I, into I moved Warner in, Brothers? I moved into the old <laughs> building. It was the old Warner Brothers building. East Squared, Steve Earle's label was on the second floor. Mm. And we were on the third floor. It was just a little three-story brick building built in the 1800s. And um, <clears throat> I camped out in that room. Had a little fold out mattress. There was a wall of vinyl, and that's when I started getting exposure to Lucinda Williams and Towns Van Zant because that publisher, you know, started playing me. Ah. And that was like, oh, was that so? That was like sort of your left turn into yes, into yes, alt country, if yes, you will. alt country, and then being a traditional country sounding singer. Like he wanted to be a record producer. So as I was writing songs, we would go in and be real serious about the demos that we made. Right. And have like Kenny Vaughn and you know all those Richard Bennett and all mm. those guys playing um, in Nashville. You can get those players, yeah. you know. And and Kenny so that Vaughn. first little blue record is those demos that oh, I was okay. making during that time. And so that's those what are like led songwriter to, demos for yes. your publishing deal. Yes, that's Got exactly it. what they were. And did they we used our you... demo budget to make that record? So did they? Did, and were they okay with you putting it out as a thing, or did you? They kinda... didn't. They weren't paying any attention. It was oh, a big nice. old like New York based <laughs> company, <laughs> right. and we were down in the, like the little Nashville office of yeah. Star Day and King Records. Yeah. So they weren't paying any attention to us. You know, and the and the the guy that signed me had aspirations of being a producer, so we were just using our little seven hundred and fifty dollar a song budget, right, to go in and make those little. And and when we put it out, it wasn't put out. You know, it was like right. at that time there was a, yeah, 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 I've literally hand cut the artwork out from Kinkos. Like this we seems to be a out. running theme, considering yeah. the T shirt on my. <laughs> I know, on I'm my chair. back yeah. to it. I'm back to it. <laughs> So yeah, it was homemade. It was homemade, and then that led to the Grand Ole Opry and the the deal with Atlantic. Okay, records. so how did that happen? So Atlantic caught wind of that record or something? Yes, I was playing around Nashville, um, playing those songs that I was writing, and when we spread that little that little blue record around everywhere, and yeah, the next thing I know, I was doing showcases for major labels, and a bunch of them were coming out. Mm. And we had deals coming in, and and we signed with um with Barry Coburn and Atlantic. 
Now yes. you talked about that experience a little bit about being on a major label. Mm -hmm. um, what was the end of that relationship like? Like how did that? How did things end? Yeah, because you. Well, I mean, because you did one record on and then, but you've had a bunch since. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> it was. Uh, I see. Warner Brothers then got the contract. They petered out the Hey Y'all record. I knew that I wasn't jiving. I just wasn't really capable, to be honest, of making anything that they were going to put resources right. behind. The clock was ticking on my my publishing deal. Um, I went to Warner Brothers and asked to be released from my contract. Okay. Thinking that I was walking into a deal at Sony. Um I'd already had the meeting with Sony. But apparently, <laughs> uh, when uh, I got off the Warner Brothers deal, the Sony people said that my meeting was too much about what all I would not do. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't I didn't get that deal. Then I, the clock's <laughs> really ticking on my publishing deal because there's no way they're going to renew my publishing deal if I don't have a major label record deal at the money right. I was making at the time. I got in there. I went and got a job waiting tables. I... Um, got to writing all I could and then making demos with the demo budget that I had to exhaust my demo budget and did the exact same thing I did with the blue record, which was make a little indie record right. out of publishing demos. And that's this side of the moon that then got picked up by 30 Tigers. Oh, um, okay. And then that put me in business with 30 Tigers. I was still working the Grand Ole Opry and uh, was getting some festivals and stuff here and there. And just it, when those started coming in, I was able to quit the that job and um, just start. Just start touring, and, and then I made I wrote "Balls to Be a Woman" right in two thousand eight, and at that point I was selling shoes at a rich lady store because they had face cream I really liked, and it was <laughs> I could get it half off if I worked there, and I'd gotten addicted to it on my Warner Brothers money, so mm. I was selling shoes there, and, it's tough and when they you get were addicted really to high end. I like products, the baby. good products. <laughs> right. I like my products, and. Uh. And she was really cool, this lady I worked for, and she would let me go off on tour for two or three weeks. So I would go out and open for Nancy Griffith or Rodney mm. Crowell, and that's when I made the Balls album. With, Is that when Rodney. you really, was it sort of post-major uh, label that you really started touring a lot and developing a Yes, a which I had thing. always wanted to do, and I was super right. frustrated that the labels, at least the Nashville mindset for me, was not to to build touring um yeah that's something you do like they'll send you on a radio tour where right. you just go around to radio stations sure. and basically they bribe those guys to play your record it was yeah. all very disgusting um and i just wanted i wanted to get in a van with i was in my 20s i wanted to get in a van with some you know dudes and girls and go hit the road yeah. go hit the road and do yeah. the deal because also i that's knew the romance of I, the whole thing right it, it is but i also knew that my skill set wasn't where it needed to be right and that the only way I was going to get it there was to go duke it out in, it's, it's in clubs. And, that and they really weren't interested. Like, they wanted my first gig to be the CMA Awards. Right. You know, and I was like, I, that's... Hey, let like, me go tour and club for a couple of years before I do that. Please, Jesus. Yeah. please. So I was desperate to do that. So I finally did um, get to do that. Um, probably started touring good about around 2008. It's interesting to me that that's still the mindset um, in sort of the mainstream country music business, especially mm -hmm. as, you know, we all have to tour to make money. That's like the yeah. only way to make any money and nobody really sells records anymore. And I'm sure that's right. even the case, you know, in, in mainstream country music, so as yeah. affected by that as anybody else. You Live know? shows and t-shirts, you yeah. know, and it's like, I, yeah, that it was always super frustrating to me. Right. I was desperate to get out there and do it. Going through that, like the sort of major label ringer, um, for a lot of artists, would be the end. You know, when that came to the end mm -hmm. of your deal or whatever, that would have, you know, killed a lot of bands. It has killed a lot of bands, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of artists. But you kept on going, and you've obviously made a bunch of records since then, and have had, you know, more success, you know, not being on a major label than you mm -hmm. had on, on a major yeah. label, right? Um, have, has major labels come back to you now? You know, in the sort of post Letterman, <laughs> post bigger exposure, post Sirius XM time. There's been some sniffing around. Right. Uh, um, would for you me, go back into that world? I just don't know. I don't know what. I would have to really have a sit down and wrap my head around what their expectations are and what they would do, what they would do on their end to help me meet those expectations. Like, what does putting out a record on me look like to them? What does that entail? Right. How much are they going to spend? How many videos are we making? Um, what does it look like? And making sure everybody was on the same page. Because I kind of feel like that was a conversation that never happened. Right. Um, there was just this assumption 
uh, that I was going to, uh, you know, she'll be famous, she'll be rich, we'll fit her into this thing, it'll be great, and that that was all going to be okay. Um, so I would have to really understand what their right what their intentions and expectations what are we all were. Here, what do we bring? Right? Yeah. What like what do y'all even do now? Like I don't even know what you do, <laughs> right. and what do I even do? Like I don't know what we. How do we how, in this day and age? What does the what does a major label record release look like? Right. Like I don't know. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, I I interviewed Chris Stapleton a while ago, and he had you know, a similar story to what you're talking about. You know, he made a whole record. They decided not to put it out. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they meanwhile, like same kind of deal. People, the head of the label, you know, gets replaced yeah. or whatever. So now it's a new people, not the people that signed him. And then he made made some singles or something, and it didn't really go. And then yeah, and then eventually. He had to get the you know the label to basically agree to let him go on the road and kind of work it differently. Yes, and then he had success. Yeah, you find I think you find your voice, you find right. your tribe, you find you, you know, and you, and you got to go out and try and connect. I think to do those, you need that opportunity to connect and fill it out. Yeah, and um, and there there's for some reason just doesn't seem to be a lot of stock in that approach. I don't know why. Right, because it seems so basic and obvious to me. Like they do this research to try and figure out what the what the single should be, right? And send it to like here's you know a housewife and she's like doing her laundry and what song does she what's her she's gonna fill out a survey after listening to this record like what send me on tour I'll come back and tell you what your single <laughs> is because I'll know because it's the one that the drunk people yelled to sure exactly yeah you can always feel it live it's like yeah, yeah. it's like that was so and that's just such a much more organic and I feel like. Um, altruistic way right. to to land on that information. Well, people like you or me always come from it from you know the 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 viewpoint of an artist. I bet we're wrong in the, in the, in the, in the <laughs> long run. Probably. Like I bet I bet they're we a much bigger know, corporate entity doing it the way that they do it. You know what I yeah. mean? But it would be better for us if they did it the way we said. Right. <laughs> you That's know what I mean? right. I know. <laughs> well, you know, because I think we we want to feel that connection. Yeah. And, and so that's everything. Like our payoff and our validation comes from that. Right. And their validation comes from selling widgets or whatever, yeah. you know. So. Um, how big of an impact, I mean, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, how much did that change things, that your Letterman appearance is? Well, it, you know... And he's even come on your show, right? Yes, yeah. yes. It it was. Um, he is committed to your career, yeah, clearly. No, strikingly validating, <laughs> for sure. Um, not only on a personal level, but for sure on on a um, on a professional level. Mm. Um, you know how it's it's true, and I'm sure you've heard this before. It's like somebody doesn't you know know if they think something's good or not until somebody else tells them it totally. is. Yeah. So David Letterman is somebody that tapped me on the head and was like this girl you know listen to her um and that's just been huge 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 no doubt and and people that i because i feel like i tend to write sort of plain in a plaintive way that's very connected to just how i talk anybody that came to liking me maybe through seeing me just interviewed on letterman then if they dig into the songs we'll find that same voice is still it's not like I'm right. one person there and I'm completely different somewhere sure. else. So, so I, it's really brought people in to me as a singer songwriter. Even it's yeah. been great, and he's 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 awesome. He's just special. He really is. Well, so what what's what's next for you then? Do you have another record? Yes, uh, ready I'm writing to go? songs for a new record, and I'm really for the first time not. Um, tortured about it. Maybe that means they'll really suck, but. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel excited and inspired. I'm not feeling so tortured and and upset and self-loathing about the process. Mm. Um, I feel good. I feel. I keep good. waiting for the day that I sit down and write a song, and, and it feels really like stress-free and easy. <laughs> that, that that has yeah. yet to happen. You know, what I mean? <laughs> every time you're like, "Wait, how do you do this again?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a uh, boy. It's it's something to try and do, but. Um, I think I'm so pent up, you know, from it could, because even at Exodus wasn't like this true free flowing on some levels. That I was, I was out of my mind on psych meds. Really, like mm. I hardly remember. Really, um, yeah. Where do you I think really the remember. next album will go stylistically? Um, you know, 
I always predict, and then like we said that Exodus was going to be a country funk record. Right. Hilarious. You know, not even close. Um, so I can predict what I think this is going to be, and it, that's definitely what it won't be then. But I feel like it might be some sort of marriage between what Welder was and what Exodus was, mm. in that it's going to be a little bit more of a sharper folk narrative sounding voice, but with, a, with more of that, I like that spacey soundscape. Yeah. So I kind of want to stay in that trippy ethereal zone mm. but be a little more present nice that's my that's my ideal it definitely won't happen you know who <laughs> right. knows like right. who knows because there's so many variables that you can't control and you involve other people and you don't know sure. what they're going to bring and yeah that's it's all about the collaboration yeah the yeah. yeah and trying to figure out who that's going to be like i you know i've got who do you I've want got to work a list. With? Like what producers? I've got a list of names, and I don't want to jinx. I and because I just I don't know. I'm 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 taking inventory and stock around me, mm. and um, thinking about it. And I'm only like four songs for sure right. for the that right. I know I want on the next record, and I want to let the material continue and really have that pretty set. Yeah. When I made Welder with Dom was, you know, he. Oh, Don I, was made that. Don right? was made welder. Uh, yeah, I I came in and and he you know he said I think in an interview he was like the work was done when I got off the plane because she'd already written all these songs and yeah. he said I put them in categories A B and C and list in like blocks of priority we have to cut these we can't get to these we can't and then we got in the studio and just bobbed it out right. on what felt good. It's so and, good to um, go into making a record with more songs than you need. I have it's the best to feeling and of I all OCD time. out real bad yeah. and I like I think the day before we made welder I spent four hundred dollars at Kinko's putting together a D-ring binder of in alphabetical order all the songs with charts and lyrics. So whatever song he called, I had I could flip to it and pass out lyrics and charts. And I had everything that I had written that was up for grabs on that record in that mm. D-ring binder. And I like going in the studio with that. I have to color code great, and highlight yeah. everything. It's good. I love having the book. The book. The it's book just like your little record Bible. Yeah. And um, so I'm working on working on getting my little book together. Cool. And I love it. I've had a great summer. I've been off all summer. And, oh, nice. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear what you do next. Thank um, you. Would you like to play a song? You don't have to. I will. I will try. <laughs> um, that's I, always my favorite when people say that i'll try and then they just kill it well but i will say because i wanted to i'd love to try and do this new one but i don't know if i remember it all oh okay so if i don't get it can we just Scrap cut it. that yeah, out fuck it. okay totally. can I, I didn't bring a guitar either i'm not very you can proud. totally use that one and it's even in tune all right intro it or not or whatever all right, I'll try it. Gosh, I'm afraid I'm not gonna remember all these verses, but I'm gonna try it. Um, this is a, this is a new song, and it's every word of it's true, and it's um, about around my parents' little honky tonk bands down in Central Florida. It's called Stanley by God Terry. Stanley by God Terry knew exactly how it felt to play a George Jones song in a white leather bell with matching shoes, polyester blues. At the Pine Grove Lounge where all you can drink booze, a bloody bucket of old broads and men. Who had been clean shaven when they started? Stanley got going with mom on by his side and daddy on bass singing Charlie Pride Collider Folsom Stand by your man just a few you might hear from the band nobody gets it like Tom T. Sad spun laughs off a disco ball They could kind of play, but they could really drink. Somebody finally say exactly what they think. And sold us pine salt last night's beer. Make some mighty fine line between fun and fear. There's a fighter in every dancing fool. I watched it all as a baby from a black bar stool. 
Stanley's wife Carol didn't care to hang around She liked her drink She didn't take it in town They knocked down drag out Every weekend By Sunday Somebody's face was on the men Passed out cold On the concrete porch Love sure is a bitch When you live her South in the county had a whole nother bar with a band we played Since it wasn't very far, there were more strange women Even more smoke in a field past a legendary live oak Carol came in hot on Hennessy Left and wrapped her car around that live oak tree I remember in the morning, Mama dropping the phone. I remember hush words, hearing Daddy groan. They had a pretty daughter, shy little Sherry. We went and picked her up from the school library. She was 16 and could sing so sweet. On a really good night, she'd babysit. After all that, it gets kind of cloudy, but two years later she was Miss Sumter County, a small town trashy, tragic ghost. She feathered her hair and sang the rose. The whole cow palace knew just how she felt. Standing by God, Terry wore a white leather bed. Country music and hillbilly pain Make stories that'll hurt you And hold you like a chain I remember them all kind. I can't sing worth the shit right now, but you're more of a pro than you know. I'm out of breath from talking so much, and I'm just that a little great. four cylinder lungs in my yeah. side. I didn't have any air. But. Well, thank you for doing that, and thank you for coming there. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank it's you, awesome. thank Love you it. for having me. I'm so honored. Yeah, you know where I am. You heard it here first. That was an exclusive Walk in the Floor acoustic performance by Elizabeth Cook of a brand new song that you can't get anywhere else but here for now. All right, make sure you go to elizabeth-cook.com. It's her website. Um, I know she's got a bunch of tour dates and whatnot. I think she's always touring and doing something. Listen to her on Sirius XM Outlaw Country, Elizabeth Cook's Apron Strings. And uh, go get her latest record, Exodus of Venus, came out last year. All right, that's it for this week. As always, make sure you go onto your Spotify account and look for that Walking the Floor playlist and follow it. We need more followers. More, more, more. We got to have more. We got like 1,000, but we need 499,000 more people to follow it. And then we're going to be like the most powerful playlist in Spotify and come don't you want that to happen and then you can have a part in that and we'll just start controlling shit all right make sure that you go uh, on to the iTunes store and listen to all the old episodes of walking the floor they're all up there and they're gonna be there forever for your listening pleasure so check it out that's it for this week we'll be back next week adios amigo free.